when I was thinking about what to preach about, I realized that when I think about where, what we believe in and what we see and, and what we experience around us, that there's a lot of things that actually amaze me. And usually when you think of the word amaze, you always think of things that are really, really special in a way. And, um, and usually in a really positive way, right? You're amazed by one thing or another. And today I want to actually talk about things that actually amaze me. And I'm just going to open up my Bible as well in the right spot so we can get going. <clears throat> but my first question before we talk about what amazes me is I'd like to ask you, how many of you are born after the year of 1990? All right. Mostly on this half. You're on the wrong half. <laughs> and so for those of you that came after the year 1990, you might not actually recognize who this is. Am I right? Or do you actually do know who this is? So what's interesting is that a lot of people know what this is, and usually, I mean, everyone's going to say, obviously, this is The Little Mermaid, and everyone's going to say, well, you know, that was a great cartoon, we'd watch it again and again, um, but, you know, nobody actually believes in mermaids, right? Who here actually believes that mermaids exist and that Ariel is somewhere swimming in the ocean? Not very many. Maybe there is one or two. Oh, I think I might have seen an, a hand go up. I caught that. You thought I was looking the other way, but I saw you. I won't name any names. But what's interesting about this is that humans actually really believe that this was true, that mermaids really did exist. Um, all throughout the, uh, um, the 1400s, the 1500s, the 1600s, people really believed that mermaids were seen and that they believe them. And actually, when you do some research, you actually find out that mermaids were spotted as recently as like this year. People still believe that they've seen mermaids. It's a little bit... Crazy. Now, what happened was one time me and Hannah uh, got to go to the aquarium, uh, downtown aquarium, and in there there's a section for believe it or not. And guess what we got to see? A mermaid. So this mermaid we actually saw, and I'm like, what? What mermaid actually exists? And do you want to see what this mermaid actually looks like? This is basically how this mermaid looked. You can't really see it all that well. We'll, we'll get this fixed one time, I promise. But... Um, when we look at this mermaid, you know, it doesn't all look all that pretty. But what happens is in, in 1830s, in the 1830s, there was a man by the name of P.T. Barnum that basically said, look, I have found mermaids, and I will show it to you. I will put it on display for you. And for a measly 25 cents, and some people say it was 50 cents, you can come in and look at this mermaid. And basically, he said that he found this mermaid in the Fiji Islands, and he basically found it. It was this contraption between, you know, this tail uh, that looked like this, and the body was something different. It was like a human-like body. Like, it must be real. And so many people actually believed him that they paid money to go and see this. They had to see for themselves that this was real. And actually, you can see it downtown as well. And later, he made lots and lots of money. And later on in his life, he finally came back and said, you know what, it was a fake. <laughs> I actually stitched together the body of a fish together with the body of a small um, monkey, and I stitched it together, and you know, that's how I made my millions in the 1800s. And so it really brings me to the first thing that amazes me today, is how he said, and this is a quote, to modern eyes it was an obvious fake, but it fooled and intrigued many at the time. Such a simple thing. Who can believe in mermaids, yet people paid to go and see this and believed it to be true? So much so that when the first thing that amazes me is how humans are so intrigued and fooled by all kinds of things. Next thing, we're going to continue this story. We're going to continue this with this thing. Who knows the Bombardier Beetle? And I will never forget when Tomislav Tedesin had, had visited us. It's been a number of years back. But this is one example that really stuck in my mind. Tomislav Tedesin brought up this idea of this beetle. And this beetle being so very special because um, of it, some of its properties. So first off, beetles can fly. But they can't actually get their wings out very quickly. It actually takes them time to get them out. They have to get rid of that outer shell 
first. It's called the elytra. They have to get rid of that first, and then they can fly. And so scientists believe that it takes a really long time for them to fly, so they've actually developed this ability in order to protect themselves. Now, the way that they actually protect themselves is by having two storage chambers inside of their abdomen, in their stomach area. They have two compartments. The first one, which is bigger, has what are called hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide. Now, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinones themselves um, don't actually do anything on their own. They actually are kind of useless to this beetle on its own. And what happens is it has a second compartment right next to it, completely isolated, of enzymes called uh, um, cata uh, catalases and peroxidases. So there, there's this enzyme in there, a catalase, together with hydrogen peroxide. And when he needs to use it, he combines the two together, which causes an explosion. Actually, it oxidizes, it causes an, an, a chemical reaction between the two to cause an explosion so that not only does it shoot out at its prey, but when it combines, it's actually harmful to the prey, number one. Second thing, it shoots out, you can actually hear it, it's like an explosion, pop, and it comes out at 100 degrees Celsius when this chemical combines. And so the question really becomes, you know, Evolutionists actually think, well, look, this is actually an excellent example of survival of the fittest. They say random mutations over many years resulted in the protective mechanism that increased the chances for survival, which is the essence of evolution. But the thing is, it still raises a lot of questions. And in these articles that I found, they mention the same things that a lot of creationists or people that believe in creation say this. Why would there be separate glands to begin with? One chamber is actually completely useless without the other. So this idea of that random mutations causing this two separate chambers to create itself, to have exactly the right types of chemicals inside so that it doesn't damage the body inside, and only to cause damage when it comes outside. There's a lot of things that have to actually happen to make that happen. And not only that, but because the wings are so slow to come out, how did it even survive if it took many, many years in order for this part to come. Why didn't they just go extinct? They're so much slower than everything else. How did just the right chemicals form by random mutation? How? You have to ask some questions. Another thing that came up, about 20 years ago, they actually detected uh, something around genes. So Last year, though, they reported something really interesting. There's a single gene mutation. This is a, an article of September 11th, 20, um, 2018. And in 2012, uh, sorry, in September 12th last year, it was published in a paper. And it basically said, you know what? We've actually found out that there's a single gene inside of the human body that may have helped humans become optimal long distance runners. And so to put this in perspective, this was and how scientists kind of define this gene is by saying, you know, this actually happened two and a half million years ago. That's how evolutionists are going to say it. That this gene actually transformed and caused us to run better and faster and further. And what happened was we used to live in the forests, and now this allowed us to come out of the forest to run in the plains. Very interesting. So what happened was 20 years ago, they actually detected that this gene was something that differentiated us, one of the differentiators between us and chimpanzees. All right. And so this is what the article says. So this gene causes uh, the human ability to run long distances and basically allows ancestors to hunt in the heat of the day when other carnivores were resting and to pursue prey to their point of exhaustion a technique called persistence hunting. That's how they explain this gene. So let's repeat what actually happened. So this gene was called CMAH. This gene had actually mutated. And what happened was it, it lost its function. It has a specific function. When did this happen? They say two to three million years ago. How did they de determine that? I actually don't know. It just wasn't in the article. I'll let evolutionists defend that. But then the question was, why did it mutate? What do you think, what causes a gene to mutate? And when we read it, this is the response in that article. Perhaps in response to evolutionary pressures caused by an ancient pathogen. Do you know what a pathogen is? A pathogen is like a disease 
a bacterial virus or a bacterium or a virus that actually caused this to actually happen. Now, what's interesting to me behind all this is that the net result of actually losing this uh, CMAH gene function, the first one was, well, we could now run far. Great. So scientists discovered. And you know how they did this? They actually tested removing this gene's function from mice, and they actually had mice run really, really long on, on their treadmills, much, much longer than any other one. So they actually discovered this gene does help us run. But then the number two thing that happens with this gene is there's an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, and there's an elevated cancer risk associated with red meat consumption. And I find it really interesting because it's such a paradox. You were in the forests, now you're coming out to the plains and you can hunt better than anyone else, yet the thing that you're hunting causes you cancer. I just found that really interesting. So yes, you can run further. And so um, to me, I have to ask a couple more questions. When you look in um, what scientists talk about uh, gene mutation and us actually evolving, uh, they, they highlight some of these six winning mutations that happen over a span of 15 million years. Amazing. There are six of them that are amazing. And one of them, I'll just say, is one of them is that the jaw, how did they, how, how did they actually put it? The muscles weaken in our jaw, which allowed our skulls and brains to expand. Wonderful. This happened five million years ago of that particular gene that changed our sculpture so that you know, our brain can get bigger. Wonderful. You know, it took only five million years, but you know, six winning mutations. It actually seems to me that the way science actually describes this is that it actually portrays this picture as being an accurate representation as to where we're headed. And people that you know, are older in the 80s or 90s probably, or I mean younger than um, perhaps others will know this cartoon, is based off of genes and becoming superhuman in a way from these genes. But you know, what's interesting is that they quote, they make this quote, most random genetic changes caused by evolution are neutral. So genetic change happens, but nothing happens. Most of them are like that. Some are harmful, but few turn out to be positive improvements. All right. Uh, today, if you didn't realize that uh, scientists think that today our humans are actually going through some genetic mutations right now. Uh, one of them has to do with uh, women, uh, I, oh, let me see what it uh, was actually called. It's actually called, um, oh, it was a really good name, and I can't find it now, but that's okay. The point is that we actually three in th see in three colors, right? And one of these uh, genes that are happening right now is this ability for females to be able to see a fourth type of color. And so they think that there's some women that could actually see something like the way that birds see. Uh, very, very interesting. And you know how many people they found had this? They said, we have at least one instance of this actually happening. Well, that's good. It's, it's coming. But you know what I did was I, I went to genome.gov. It's a government agency talking about specific genetic disorders. And I wanted to think about, well, what do genes actually, how do they actually impact our lives around us? And when I looked, this is the list of genetic disorders that are actually happening uh, that are disorders, that aren't actually positive. I listed six that were positive in 15 million years. These are happening right now of genetic problems that people have. This list from genome.gov. And then I went over to this website. It's called GARD. It's the Genetic and Rare Diseases Info Center. And I wanted to actually list for this group here the number of a gene or, or rare diseases that actually come up. Do you want to see this list? All right, here we go. Here's the list. You don't have to read every one of them, but this list doesn't stop there. This is list number two. This is list number three. This is list number four. This is list number five. This is list number six. And I got tired of copying and pasting so many different ones. And so, you know what I came up with? I came up with a number. I found out, I actually copied and pasted into my notebook, and I found 2,149 diseases related to our genes for the letter A. 
for the letter A. And so I have to ask myself a little bit, you know, from all these improvements that we've seen in evolution that make us what we are today, as the evolutionist says, I have to ask the question. So the second thing that amazes me is how easily the theory of evolution is just taken as is. Why? Why is it so simple to accept evolution today? And many of our friends and family around us, why do people accept evolution so easily? And I want to open our Bibles. I want to open to something that I personally really trust. And we're going to open our Bibles to 1 Timothy. I particularly like Timothy. My baptism verse actually comes from Timothy as well. I really, really like it. And what I'd like to open up for for us this morning is this idea. 1 Timothy 1, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 18, which says this. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. Now, let me ask you something. How many here have actually heard prophecies in the Bible? Have you ever heard of prophecies in the Bible? Yes, you're still with me? How many of you have heard prophecies about Timothy? Not very many. And actually, when I started looking at this, I'm like, prophecies concerning Timothy? Well, that's really interesting. And so we started digging, and it turns out that we can actually turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 13 for an actual example. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1, it says this, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. So we realize that in the early church, there were prophets and there were teachers. Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menain, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So what we see here are a few things that are happening. This is the, the, the early church. We see the Holy Spirit in action. Number one, you see the Holy Spirit come here and it tells them a very specific message that the Holy Spirit has. He's talking to them and he says, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called. And it says later in the next verse that the Holy Spirit sends them as well. We see the Holy Spirit in action, number one. Number two, we see prophets and teachers that are in there in the mix. And if you actually turn back to 1 Timothy, Um, yeah, back to 1 Timothy, we can actually see in other verses as well that kind of, you know, Timothy might have actually been called the same way with prophets there in the mix that are actually giving him direction. Hey, Timothy, we know that you are actually going to do this or that or the other. I don't know exactly what they told him, but we know that prophets were part of that process. So when we started researching here, I found some quotes that talk about this, and it says, the main question here is whether uh, whether Paul means prophecies from Torah or prophecies pronounced over Timothy as he embarked on his mission. So it could be one or the other. We don't know 100%, but we know prophecies had an important role in the role of Timothy. Now, what are we actually talking about when we think of prophecies? There's a couple things that I kind of wanted to bring up Uh, that are really important when it comes to um, prophecies. The first thing that I wanted to mention is that prophecies always talk about something that will happen in the future, right? I mean, that's typically why we're listening to prophecies. But the thing is that we only really fully understand the prophecy after it's actually happened. And you know, this quarter we've been studying a lot about prophecies and different things that have gone on. But if you think about how many prophecies were mentioned in the Bible, but people still didn't recognize how that was going to happen. They just didn't get it, you know. But when it happened, it became very clear that it was true. And when we think of the Bible, we actually think (coughs) that prophecies become extremely powerful. Extremely powerful because there's just no way to explain it that over a span of hundreds and hundreds of years, something could be so accurate and so uh, representative of where we are today. And when we look at this, you know, this is one of the most classic ones. And I didn't want to go through every prophecy in detail. I just wanted to give an overview. 
you know, one of those prophecies is around time periods, the kingdoms. In Daniel chapter 2 and J Daniel chapter 7, it becomes very clear across two different types of pictures, two different types of images, whether it's the statue or whether it's through the, these beasts, that you have the four kingdoms coming up. Realize that the Bible's not talking about the most powerful kingdoms on earth. You know, many times people say, oh, but what about Asia? Oh, what about uh, this culture? What about India? All these powerful um, kingdoms that had existed. Why doesn't the Bible talk about them? That's not actually the point. The point is that God knew prophetically exactly, and the Bible is defining exactly, this kingdom will follow that kingdom, will follow that kingdom, will follow that one. And you know what is happening at the very end? Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. We know each of these kingdoms have actually taken place already, and we're just waiting now for that final one. We get this one glimpse through prophecy that we know God's in control. The second thing is time periods through churches, and we studied this a few weeks ago. Talk about Revelation 2 and 3. Talks about the various types of churches in the first early church. But those same churches represent different time periods again and again. And through a different angle, the same message is saying, being said that through Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, all of these churches that represent certain characteristics of the church, they portray exactly how the church is actually going to look through time periods of history that we know it as uh, up until today. And again, we have a second message that says we're near the end times yet again. The third thing that comes up, another time period one around the Messiah. Again, we see this prophecy that says bang on. And you know what? This prophecy in Daniel was there for a while, mentioning exactly when the Messiah was going to come, when he was actually going to start his ministry, when he was actually going to die, and even when the ministry was going to take a shift to go to the rest of the world through Gentiles. Nobody could have known that it was Stephen dying um, his martyr's death by the stone, that then that's when you know, the pro prophecy will be fulfilled. But afterwards, when we look back, we can see for confidence, absolute certainty, that now we have Jesus. Not only is he the right age, but the actions that he took, his baptism, to his death and resurrection, and to uh, Stephen stoning, we see this prophecy fulfilled. And again, we see another prophecy, the same one is an extension of this one, talking about when Jesus here, is here on earth and what's happening, and then leading us straight into 1844, which our church is really well known for, where people at that time thought Jesus was going to come, and he didn't. They mistakenly understood the prophecy, but it's afterwards that again, we can recognize that prophecy is true. And yet again, we have another uh, picture of it, we're in the end times. We're in that final period of human history before Jesus comes. Time and time again, we have prophecies about Jesus and how he was going to be born, when he's going to be born. We have prophecies that talk about how he's going to die, um, exactly what that was going to look like. Everything has been foretold that really mattered over and over and over again. And so you start realizing that there's these pillars of prophecy, pillars that really define the Bible and why we believe in it, Periods of humanity, Jesus and his ministry, the end times, state of society, and more. Think of how the Bible describes what our state around us is like when it comes to morals, when it comes to society, when it comes to the human condition, when it comes to the great controversy happening around us. Just a couple verses about this. In Matthew, he talks about morals, who even looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. When we think of society, we think of people, lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud. When we think of uh, our human condition, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we think of that great controversy happening around us, the great dragon has cast out, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. It brings up so much, explains so much, not only in history, but it explains why? To trust it. From every angle, from our family homes to morals to our society that we live in today, the Bible is explaining the state of it over and over again. And so it brings me to amazement number three. is How is it the Bible that's so foundational, even to the laws that we have in our countries, it, reliable in everything that it's actually predicted, truthful in explaining who I really am, yet what we do is we spend time 
with just about anything else, whether it be Netflix, whether it be shooting whatever, pool, whether it be going swimming, whether it be like anything that we can do, reading any other book but the Bible. What is going on? How is it that we just keep discarding it? We continue back in 1 Timothy 1.18. It says, Previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. We start realizing that there's some sort of war going on. It's definitely a spiritual war that we're talking about. It's talking about, like, right now, you and I, the Bible is describing that we're in some sort of warfare right now. That there's a battle happening around us. And when we think of it, um, this quote was really, really good, where it talks about Timothy's ministry in Ephesus is aided by the knowledge gained through the prophecies, which will become weapons of his good spiritual warfare. So what we see here is that Timothy's ministry in Ephesus is aided by the knowledge. You know, we can get so caught up in prophecies that I just shared with you. We can get so caught up as to what's actually going to happen in the future which we won't know, instead of remembering that the prophecy's purpose is to give us confidence, to aid us, to help us, to encourage us, to let us know that Jesus is in control, aided by the knowledge gained through the prophecies, to help in that battle. And listen to what kind of battle is going on. Let's take a look in uh, verses 3 and 4, just one page earlier. 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia... Remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that, te- that they teach no other doctrine. So it was a doctrinal issue at this time. We see doctrines that creep in from all over, um, all over the place. A doctrine that comes in a different idea. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies. I started out with this idea of the mermaids. And he brings up fables. Like, don't get caught up with these stories of things that don't mean anything. Stop just getting caught up with these stories or movies or shows. Or, they just don't mean anything. They're just fables. Don't get caught up with this stuff. And endless genealogies. You know, who knows? What, uh, genealogies, maybe they were just trying to find out, you know, oh, but I actually came from this line. Or I actually came from this ancestral line. Or today we talk about, oh, I actually came from this evolutionistic ancestry line. Right? Don't get caught up with this stuff, which caused disputes rather than godly edification, which is in faith. Godly edification. Do you know what, we know that, what that word edification means? That moral and intellectual improvement. If we are spending time or if we're spending things around the Bible that aren't actually helping the church, aren't helping us, like individually helping us as church members grow, helping others that are learning about Christ to get to know him more fully in order to grow Morally and intellectually, we're just like telling them all kinds of other stories, not focused on the gospel, focused on what God wants them to do, which is in faith. If you're noticing that there's a new theology that comes up that causes more disputes and more fights than anything else, there's a problem. If we look what Timothy says about this problem, it becomes very serious. 1 verse 5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. And we can see, like on the screen, it's really evident. Verse 19, it continues, Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected concerning the faith. Some have rejected. But we see that these two come hand in hand. Faith and conscience. Conscience and faith. So one author actually writes about this and comments, for Paul, you see, what a person believes, his faith, and how that person behaves, his conscience, are inseparable. You can't divide those two. So what the person believes, is Paul saying, and how that person behaves are so important. You see, the opponents, the ones with the false doctrines, the ones with uh, leading them all over the place, illicit behavior is a clear indication of the falseness of their teaching. Oh, how important it is how to make sure that those two are hand in hand. And so number four that amazes me is how easily faith and conscience are compromised by truth. We can't compromise those things. We can't compromise on faith. We can't compromise on our conscience. We can't compromise on how we behave and act. 
can compromise. And next thing we continue to read, and we're going to finish with this final example. And it talks about, um, I, I love the way that Paul writes this. 1 Timothy 1, 18 and 19. Having faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. They have rejected it concerning the faith, having suffered a shipwreck. I don't know if you've ever felt that way in your faith. That everything that's going on, and you just feel like it's a big shipwreck that just happened around you. That things were going okay, that you were sailing along, and boom, things start to crumble around you. Whether it's your faith, whether your conscience. The example that um, I wanted to share was 18 and 19. You know, the example also, if you just look at the other side of your page, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. The conscience no longer is actually taking place. It's seared. It's kind of like, you know, when you take that hot iron and you're about to iron something on and you're ironing and it's really hot and all of a sudden you touch your hand and it's searing you. It really, really hurts. It's kind of like our conscience. Like we're here in church. We, we grow up in church. We listen from the sermon after sermon after sermon, but somehow our conscience just gets seared. It's like we start seeing evolution. We start seeing these other stories of mermaids. We start seeing other stories of all over the place, and our conscience and the way that we behave starts getting seared. It's kind of like no longer useful. I can no longer use my hand after it's been burnt off. It's been seared off. This is kind of what happens to these people that drift. The conscience gets seared and you forget exactly why we're here. Contrasting Timothy's faith and good conscience with the opponent's lack of the same and urging Timothy to watch closely, watch himself closely, lest he fall into the same trap. You see, Paul's message to Timothy was saying, yes, your opponents, the people that we're working with, against in this context, you know, they've seared their conscience. They've done this stuff. But you know what? Just watch that this doesn't happen to you. This is an more, such an important message for me and for all of us here as well. Watch that the, it doesn't happen to you. If I look at an example, you know, when Jesus was here, Peter in Matthew 26, 35, said it very clearly. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you, he says to Jesus. How many of us have ever said to Jesus, you know what, I'm never going to disown you. I'm never actually going to leave. I made my decision for you, and I'm going to stick with it. How many of us say that? And then what happens is, that very same night, this is literally hours after he says this to Jesus, he says, I don't even know him. He says, no, I'm not him. The ones that are asking him, is this you, Peter? Aren't you the guy with Jesus? He says, I don't know what you are talking about. He gets to this state that he's completely flipped around. Everything that he's realized about Jesus was crumbling in front of him. He thought that there's, there's no way out. I don't want a part of this, but I have to see what's going to happen with Jesus. That's the state that he got to. That's the message of how much we have to be careful. But this is the most important part. There's one text, and only Luke writes it. Not Matthew, not Mark, not John. Only Luke mentions this sentence. And he says, at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. What does that actually mean? You have no idea. How did he actually look at Peter? What do you think? Was he really angry with him? It's like, Peter, I just told you. Like, come on already. And this is where Ellen White comes in and just knocks it out of the park. She just explains it so clearly. The Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked upon his poor disciple. This poor man. Me. <laughs> Mladen is such a poor little man. He looks at him and he tells him, you know, in that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. This same Jesus has pity and sorrow for you and I, 
and he's waiting for you over and over again. And she continues to say, the sight of that pale, suffering face of Jesus, those quivering lips, I mean, he's already in pain, that look of compassion and forgiveness, it pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience. You know how we talked about conscience over and over again? That was seared? Now that conscience is coming back to life. Conscience was aroused and memory was active. And we know what happened to Peter. He broke down bitterly crying and he left. He couldn't take it anymore. When we think of the type of God that we serve, after everything that points to evidence towards him, as he's walked through human history over and over again, he's described how we live, he's described our society, he's described everything around us, yet we still discard the word that he gives us, we discard him sometimes, but you know what he does? He comes back to us again, compassionately, and he's praying for you, and he's asking you, you know what? With compassion and forgiveness, he pierces your heart, my heart. And number five, the things that really amaze me, and this is the most important, how could we choose someone else other than Jesus? What could be so important? What? Where our kids are going to be able to grow up knowing of a God that's going to care for them and has uh, all of history at our sides, knowing that a new world is going to be, be prepared for us, that we know that this God is waiting for you. Even when you discard him and throw him in the dirt, he's going to look at you with pity and sorrow, not anger. How many times do we look at maybe other brothers and sisters or friends and, and not thinking the same way that we do right now and we get angry and we start disputes and stuff instead of realizing that there's a battle going on around us, that they're battling. That is the reality of this world. It's not, the reality of this world is not an X-Men future that we're going to be superhuman. Hu it's not these fables of mermaids and other stories. It's really reality as to where we're headed when Jesus comes. Amen.